Hey everyone, Phil Plisky here. The most common question we get after our ACL reconstruction rehabilitation course on MedBridge is why do you emphasize that you need to achieve full knee hyperextension after ACL reconstruction? And so I thought I would dive in deep into this topic. And I, I think it comes from some uh, natural questions or natural responses that I, I hear is, so you're saying you want me to hyperextend the knee after they have it reconstructed. Isn't that one of the ways that we actually tear the ACL is by knee hyperextension? And yes, that is that's that is true. It is a mechanism of injury, but that's not exactly maybe the spirit of it. Uh, the way we need to think about it, are we wanting full knee hyperextension or are we wanting symmetrical extension range of motion equal to the contralateral side? And clearly the emphasis is symmetrical full knee extension range of motion. And some people have hyperextension as full knee extension range of motion normally. It's very common. But what I get pushback on or questions on is when I say the word hyperextension, because when we say hyperextension, the, you know, that kind of indicates a joint going beyond where it should go or its physiological norms. But I do think the reason I actually use it is because it causes people to think, do I want zero degrees of knee extension or do I want what the other side has if the other side is normal? And I actually want what the other side has. And I'll, let's go through the research of why that is and a little bit of the history of it. This has been a concept that's it's really been around a long time. So why does it matter? Uh, first of all, so that lack of range of motion uh, is related to anterior knee pain. The research is pretty clear on that, that anterior knee pain and lack of range of motion are related to decreased quad function. Quad function is clearly related to power production. And also there's some good research that uh, that it uh, decreases a person's functional perfection or per perception and their satisfaction with their surgery if that it could be because related to the anterior knee pain loss of extension range of motion and there's some research that's pointing to there may be increased risk when you lose range of motion both in flexion and extension so let's dive in a little deeper than that you know, so back, you know, this is actually a concept that comes from the early 80s, but here's a study from uh, 1989, quad weakness, that is strength less than 80% of the normal side. And some people are like, oh my gosh, I would never have that. Well, actually, I still do see that. I have patients come to me with that still after six months or nine months, uh, was present in 65% of patients and correlated positively with a flexion contracture or greater than five degrees of a lacking knee extension range of motion, patellar irritability, and uh, when they use patellar tendon grafts. Okay, so I just, I kind of set the stage. Here. This has been a concept that really has been around a long time. Shelburne was the one who really popularized uh, ACL uh, reconstruction rehabilitation from an accelerated perspective. Rather than taking over a year, let's see how we can get this down. He said with non-compliant patients tend to do better. Uh, those that weren't casted or locked in a brace for too long tended to do better. And so really this big push to get uh, return to sport even at four months. Well, I'm not advocating that, you know, the pendulum from a research perspective and our knowledge perspective has swung the other way that we should be waiting a full nine months uh, at a minimum for full return to sport. But what we need to see here is what are the good things that came out of this ACL accelerated uh, ACL reconstruction rehabilitation? And maybe the time frame isn't one of the good things, but some of the concepts are. So one of the, uh, this is a 1997 article saying anterior knee pain after ACL reconstruction is not an inherent complication associated with patellar tendon harvesting. Increased incidence of anterior knee pain with a bone patellar tendon bone graft can be prevented in a, by obtaining full knee hyperextension postoperatively. Well, let's uh, dive in a little bit more. Uh, this was, this was a, a very recent study looking at anterior knee pain predictive factors. So this was about 438 uh, ACL reconstructions. Anterior knee pain was found in 6% of the patients. So you can see from that early or late 80s where everybody had anterior knee pain, at least we've gotten that down, that it's down to 6% of the patients with anterior knee pain. 
there are two independent factors. And so when you do a logistic regression, we're looking at factors that don't necessarily just relate to each other, that they uh, are risk factors in and of themselves. Bone patellar tendon bone graft and knee extension deficit. And in this study, knee extension deficit, once again, greater than five degrees of, uh, of uh, lacking symmetry. And as we look at knee extension range of motion, well, well what is that? Well, that's probably within the error of the measure, uh, actually, or right at the, the peak of the error of the measure. So anterior knee pain is related to the bone patellar tendon bone graft, as well as a knee extension deficit. Then let's look at uh, one of Shelburne's studies uh, with 780 patients, normal range of motion. I like this definition. A normal range of motion was defined as within two degrees of the opposite knee, including hyperextension and knee flexion being within five degrees. So they looked at with that, you know, definition of 780 patients uh, at 10 years uh, on average post-surgery, what is our rate of osteoarthritis? Well, if we, what are the risk factors for having osteoarthritis? So they are abnormal knee flexion at early and final follow-up, lacking knee flexion range of motion, abnormal knee extension at final follow-up. Remember, we're defining flexion lacking five degrees, extension lacking two degrees, including hyperextension partial medial meniscectomy and articular cartilage damage. Well, we're not surprised if we damage the cartilage uh, or the meniscus to such a degree that probably are going to set us up for increased osteoarthritis or the impact or the degree or severity of that injury is probably at least more. But what I find really interesting, the odds of having osteoarthritis were two times more for patients with abnormal knee range of motion. And it's the same or similar odds as if you had a partial meniscectomy or articular cartilage damage, things that we would clearly correlate or tie to uh, neat development of knee osteoarthritis. This is saying range of motion, not having full hyperextension and full knee flexion range of motion increases a person's rate of osteoarthritis. That's huge. That's a big deal. And that's really important. The other thing is uh, anterior knee pain is related to quadriceps weakness independent of the type of graft used. So when we look at bone patellar tendon bone versus hamstring or other uh, cadaver graft, that type of thing, we want to look at quad strength. When we look at quad strength, anterior knee pain is related to that. Well, if, if, if quad strength is decreased in those who have, who lack range of motion, we can clearly see why it's a risk factor. The other thing is just to kind of step back, looking at knee flexion range of motion and uh, this is a study uh, with uh, Kate Webster that they looked at uh, patients with a flexion deficit of five degrees at over two times the odds of sustaining graft rupture. The reason I put this out here is that's kind of partly predicting retear rates, right? So lacking full flexion range of motion. So I know we're, we're asking about hyperextension, but I want to emphasize this full range of motion is essential. Full range of motion is essential for normal proprioception. It's essential for normal quad function, uh, hamstring function, hip function. All of that is important. To, and it, the basis of it is full range of motion. So one of the things that we looked at, you've probably heard me talk on this, full knee flexion, flexion range of motion is being able to get the heels, the ischial tuberosities to the heels. I like this uh, uh, position here really helps me identify that. If you see uh, the, the picture with the person, there's that little bit of space on that left uh, between the ischial tuberosity and the left heel. That's not okay. We should be restoring that fully. Now, I'm not restoring that fully at six weeks. That takes, it does take months, but they're not done with my care until they can do this. We do this very slowly. We don't go aggressively at it, but we need to restore that full ischial tuberosity to heel range of motion. Okay. Now, of course, with everything, there are considerations. Uh, our mind immediately goes to, well, what about that person who is hypermobile, that person who has more than 10 degrees of knee hyperextension or has congenital hypermobility on their bite and scale, really has a lot of factors. Well, if they have more than 10 degrees of knee hyperextension, I'm probably getting them to that 
five or 10 degree range. But I tell you what, one thing to really aggravate uh, a person who is hypermobile's knee is to have a 15, 20 degree difference between their left and right knees. Now, again, I, we find that person, people who are hypermobile, their knee range of motion tends to come back once we get it to about that five degrees of hyperextension. I don't really worry about it uh, much more than that. Hamstring graft. Hamstring grafts have a high rate or higher rate of failure and in general, increased laxity. So with a hamstring graft, because I do, because they don't have that harvestite mobility that a bone patellar tendon bone graft has, uh, hamstring grafts, I will tend to get full knee extension easily. I want to make sure that with a heel prop, they can get that knee back of the knee fully down with a good quadricep contraction. And, uh, but I'm not necessarily going for uh, a lot of range of motion beyond that initially, because those graphs, in my opinion, and I think the research bears this out, tend to stretch out a little bit more than bone, patellar tendon bone. And they also don't have the anterior knee pain, which a lot of times occurs with bone, patellar tendon bone graphs, which inhibits knee extension range of motion. So uh, one of the things that the, I like the way this study says it is the combination of extensor mechanism weakness and graft stiffness will significantly limit extension when a patellar tendon graft is used compared to a hamstring graft. So the research kind of bears this out as well. Another uh, consideration is quad tendon graft. Again, I'm going to put kind of put that in the same category uh, along with the bear procedure. I'm going to put those in the same category as hamstring graft that I want to get full extension, uh, a little bit beyond zero comfortably, but I'm not going to force that because I think that bone patellar tendon bone being that gold standard graft is the, is the one that really loses their knee extension range of motion. So bottom line, it's important to achieve full knee hyperextension because it decreases anterior knee pain. It increases quad function. Therefore, when you increase that quad function, you increase power production, functional status and satisfaction. And I don't know that knee hyperextension has been identified as a risk factor, but surely lacking knee flexion range of motion has. And it makes a lot of sense that if you have anterior knee pain, uh, quad function deficit, why wouldn't that be a risk factor for uh, re-tear or certainly other injury? And this is particularly important with bone patellar tendon bone grafts. So if you have any other questions, questions on this, additional questions about ACL reconstruction rehab, I love answering these questions. So feel free to reach out to me at philpliski.com or there's my email address as well.